I'll just have another quick prayer before we start. Dear Father in heaven, we thank you so much that we can gather together here on your special Sabbath day. And we really want to pray for your Holy Spirit to come and teach us spiritual things. We know that it's it's by your spirit that brings to our remembrance the things that you've taught us and teaches us new things that we hadn't learned before. And we want to pray that you'll send your spirit to give us understanding and wisdom and discernment as we study the symbolism in the sanctuary. And we pray that we can pattern our lives after the example that you've given us. And I pray for, for your Holy Spirit to give me the words to speak to, to, to know how to bring out things new and old from your word. We thank you so much, and we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so I wanted to talk about the sanctuary today. And you're all familiar with the story of how um, the children of Israel came to Mount Sinai, and uh, Moses went to the mountain, and the glory of the Lord descended on it. And Moses was up there 40 days and 40 nights receiving the instructions for the sanctuary. And basically the sanctuary, the instructions he gave that God gave to Moses were like a blueprint. And I'm sure a lot of you have worked with blueprints before or kind of understand how they work. So a blueprint is, gives you the, the directions of how to build something. And uh, this is a familiar verse to a lot of us, Exodus 25, 8 to 9. God said to Moses, and let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. According to all that I show thee, after the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all the instruments thereof, even so shall you make it. So there was a pattern that Moses was shown of what this was supposed to look like and uh, how it was supposed to be built. And this is also a pattern for us. This is something I've been studying uh, and thinking about a lot lately that he was supposed to make it according to the pattern shown in the mount. And here on earth, there's the Bible talks about several different sanctuaries. There's the sanctuary in heaven, and then it talks about our bodies are a sanctuary here on earth, and also the church is a sanctuary. And so we have to have our sanctuary patterned after the, the pattern that was given to Moses in the mount, and the church has to be patterned after the pattern as well. And so we're going to learn some things today about that pattern because it's really important for us because this is the pattern. If we want God to dwell in us, like he did for the children of Israel in their tabernacle there, we have to have our tabernacle patterned after that same pattern. And it's a symbolic pattern, obviously. We, we're not made out of cloth and gold and all that, but all the details of what we need to be in order to be an abiding place for the king of the universe uh, are found inside the symbolism of the sanctuary. And so we're going to look at some of that today. Now, the children of Israel were in a wilderness, kind of like this here. This is a little ways away from where they were at, but it's it looks very much like the kind of area that they were in. Here's another picture, too. So <laughs> now there's some of you that are carpenters in here. And the sanctuary, they, it had uh, boards, I think 48 boards around the outside, and they were approximately 15 feet tall. And I'm gonna check the dimensions here. I think it was 18 feet wide. 15, 15 feet tall, approximately 27 inches wide, and about four and a half inches thick. So you can imagine a board. That's, that's like twice as tall as the room here. And um, 27 inches wide, somewhere in there. And about as thick as, about as wide as your hand is thick. That's a pretty serious, huge board. And yeah, that's a beam. <laughs> and it, these, each of these boards, there were 48 of them. And each of them was covered with gold, a layer of gold on the outside. And that would make approximately total weight. I think this is including the wood of the boards as well. If you think of like pretty dense hardwood, a, a total weight of 38,400 pounds. That's 19.2 tons. The, all the boards together, yeah. <laughs> so the gold covering those boards was worth approximately eighty-seven million seven hundred eighty-seven million seven hundred thousand dollars in modern currency. It could even be more than that. It could be a hundred million. So if you think of 
take a, a bunch of millionaires out there and you gather up a hundred millionaires, that's how much this gold was worth that they covered these boards with. I think that also included the gold on the other things as well. It gives us the amount of gold in the Bible. So, so first of all, if you're helping to construct this tabernacle, there's all these boards along the, the side here, and you got to come up with wood for all those boards. And you are, uh, got switch back here. Okay. There we go. You're out here in the wilderness and you got to come up with wood to make 48 boards, 48 beams that size. So what are you going to do? <laughs> yeah. They were at uh, Mount Sinai and the name Mount Sinai, and if I understand correctly, it's connected to the, the Shittim bush. And that's probably the acacia, which this, this is actually in Africa, but it's a similar tree. This is the acacia tree. We have them in America too. And it's a pretty small tree. You're, you're not gonna find ones big enough to make 27 inch boards out of. And um, it's a tree with a lot of thorns on it. Very, a lot of, some of these species have very large thorns. It's very possible some, I think if I recall, some people have speculated that maybe the crown of thorns was made out of this kind of tree. So you've got these kind of small trees Hopefully you've got a, quite a few of them around the Mount Sinai because apparently it was named after that tree. Some There's some connection in the name there. So you're probably going to have a fair number of these trees, but still, what are you going to do with them? <laughs> you, you're going to have to put them together somehow. So you're going to have to cut the thorns off and you're going to have to smooth and polish them. And you're going to have to put them together into a, a beam. You're going to have to take a lot of small pieces, make them all the right size, the right shape, and then attach them all into a beam like that. And then you'd cover them with gold. And uh, there's some very interesting symbolism in this. For some reason, it keeps switching back. Um, I wanna read some texts here that tells us some of the symbolism Let's start with Psalms 144, verse 12. If somebody wants to look that up and read it for us. Psalms Finds it can read it. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> So we have human beings being compared to the, the trees or cornerstones in a palace and polished. Now let's read 1 Peter 2.5. It uses some similar terminology as well. This starts to bring together how the, the symbolism of the sanctuary applies to us as humans. Whoever has that can read it. You also, as lively stones, are built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Okay, so here it talks about living stones built up into a spiritual house. That's what the sanctuary was. It was a house for God to dwell in. And it also brings in the symbolism of us being a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices. So these, uh, these board, these, all these little pieces put together into these boards, it's like us as humans. We're like the trees 
and God has to polish us and trim us and cut all of our thorns off. We've got all these thorns that we poke and wound each other with. And he has to cut all those thorns off. He has to polish us and smooth us so that we can be all put together and perfectly fitted together into this beam. And then after that, it's covered with gold. And we're going to look at some quotes here that tell us the meaning of the gold. Now, the counsel of the true witness is full of encouragement and comfort. The churches may yet obtain the gold of truth, faith, and love, and be rich in heavenly treasure. So here we find out what the gold represents. It represents truth, faith, and love. And that's what, after we're all polished and put together, then we're covered with gold. And this is the truth, faith, and love is, is the gold that covers us. And here's another quote. True riches are genuine faith and genuine love. These make the character complete in Christ. If there were more faith, simple trusting faith in Jesus, there would be love, pure love, which is the gold of Christian character. So the gold represents character. And they covered the whole, all the walls with this gold. And then the, uh, I'm sure it was polished. And Ellen White talks about how it reflected the light. When you walked in, it would reflect rainbow hues of light all over. And that's what happens has to happen to us. We have to be smoothed and polished, kind of like, uh, like you do when you're woodworking. You have to be smoothed and polished and, and prepared, and then you're covered with gold. And that's the pure character, Christ-likeness. Here's another quote. We are brought into church capacity with defects of character, kind of like those, those thorns that stick out all over. But we must not retain them. We must be fitted and squared for the building, like you'd have to square those pieces of wood to put them together. We must be laborers together with God, for we are God's husbandry. We are God's building. In view of this, we must see that the temple is not defiled with sin. We should be lively stones, not dead ones but live ones that will reflect the image of Christ. We must be worshipers in spirit and in truth. So this is, we have to be squared, like each of these is squared and then they're all put together. And what does that accomplish? When it's all finished, you see the reflection of the high priest in the walls. That quote just talked about the reflection of Jesus. And that's what, that's what the gold, when, when we're as a church or as individuals, when our lives perfectly ref reflect the image of Jesus, then the world can see him. This is not always an easy process to go through. <laughs> the refining furnace is to remove the dross. The dross is kind of like the when you melt the metal, the dross is the junk that comes up to the top. When the refiner sees his image perfectly, ref when he sees his image reflected in you perfectly, he will remove you from the furnace. So the refiner has to see his image reflected just like in the walls. You will not be left to be consumed or to endure the fiery ordeal any longer than necessary for your purification. But it is necessary for you in order to reflect the divine image to submit to the process the refiner chooses for you, that you may be cleansed, purified, and every spot and blemish removed, not even a wrinkle left in your Christian character. That'd be like if there was wrinkles and defects in the gold, you couldn't see a correct image. It would be distorted. May the Lord help you to choose to have the will and work of God accomplished in you. Look up. Jesus lives. Jesus loves. Jesus pities. And he will receive you with all your burdens of care and trouble if you will come to him and lay your burdens upon him. He has promised he will never leave or forsake those who put their trust in him. So this... This process of being smoothed and polished, it's not easy, but he says he won't, he won't leave us in the furnace any longer than necessary. And I a lot of times pray the prayer, Lord, help me to be as submissive as possible so you can do your work quickly and I won't have to stay in there longer than necessary. <laughs> help me to learn the first time I go through the trial so that I don't have to keep going through it over and over or have to have it keep going and going because I was too stubborn to, to learn the lesson I needed to learn. And uh, he, he promises he won't, he won't let it destroy us. The fiery trials won't destroy us as long as we're continuing to submit to him and let him do his work on us. 
And now I want to look at the words for some of these things that we've been uh, studying. And I wanted to, first of all, explain a few things about language. I'm, I find language very fascinating. So over here we have our English language. And if you go look at, um, there's a website where you can look at like the family trees of languages and how they all go back. And it's very interesting. You can trace back all the different languages. Uh, here's the Greek language, the Aramaic, uh, Samaritan, the Phoenician, the Hebrew, even the Egyptian, all the way back. This was basically the original language. Some people, uh, there's different names for it. Some people call it uh, proto uh because they found it around Mount Sinai. They found it carved on the rocks around there. And some, this was probably the original that God gave. And somewhere in here was probably when Moses wrote the, the first five books of the Bible, it was probably written in this type of script or something in between those two. And each letter had a meaning. So each of these little symbols, little pictographs had a meaning. So the first one there is the Aleph. And that, in, when it went into Greek, it became the Alpha. And then when it went to English, it became the A. And so like here, it looks like a little ox's head. And that's what the word, the, the meaning of the letter is an oxen's head. And in the Paleo Hebrew, it was basically like a triangle with a line across. So it was like the two horns and the nose and the ears. It was still an ox's head. It was just kind of a line drawing of the oxen head. And then as it went, when it went into Greek, it got turned upside down and that became the, the Greek uh, alpha and became the letter A in English. So our letter A is basically an ox's head turned upside down. And it came from the original uh, ancient Hebrew pictographs. And the second letter is the bet. And it's like the, if you're looking at a tent from the top, it's like the floor plan of the tent. You have the door over on the side and then it kind of goes in you have the inner room. So it's like the floor plan of a tent and it means it has the meaning of house in the Egyptian, it, it was like turned a little bit different direction. And then it started kind of changing shape and you couldn't exactly tell what it was anymore, but it, that's the letter bet in Hebrew. In Greek, it became beta and in English, it's the letter B. So we still have, it's a house. You just can't really tell it's a house, <laughs> but, uh, and it goes on down, uh, the, in Hebrew, you have Aleph, Bet, Gimel, Dalet, in Greek, you have Alpha, Beta, Gamma, Delta. In English, you have A, B, and we kind of got the C and G mixed up, but G and D, it just keeps going like that. So our English alphabet, a lot of it, you can trace it back to Greek, you can trace it back to Aramaic, you can trace it all the way back to Hebrew and the very first uh, pictographic uh, characters. And so it's very interesting when we go look at the Bible words, all of these, like in, in Hebrew, these letters still have the same meaning. The, the alpha, the beta, they still have the same meaning. You just, you don't see it. Their letters are a different shape now, but they still have the same meaning. So I wanted to look at, this here is the word, the word shittim, those, those trees that had the thorns and everything that they made the wood out of. This is the, the Hebrew the pictographic the way they would write that. And the first letter is the two front teeth and it has the meaning of sharp or pressing or white. Uh, it probably is where we got our English word shiny because in Hebrew it's the word shin and it means something white or shiny. In English we get, we have the word shiny which is almost the same. And then the second letter is a container either made out of wicker or clay. So there's some really interesting uh, symbolism in this. The like if you're going to weave something out of wicker, you usually use uh, thin branches. But base, if uh, if you make, say you take the branches off the shittim tree and you weave a basket out of it, you're going to have a, a very sharp basket. <laughs> and that's uh, basically the literal meaning would be sharp basket if these two letters put together. So, but there's more deeper meaning even than that. Um, if you If you weave, the branches of this tree together, this is kind of what you'd have. Something woven out of sharp branches. 
And this is obviously the crown of thorns. And it's very possible that possibly the crown of thorns was made out of the acacia tree. And that would have perfect symbolism in it because basically Jesus, it was our, our thorns, our humanness, our, our corrupt human natures with all of their thorns, that was part of what killed him. And it was his crown was our, our pokey human natures, basically. And I think there's a lot deeper symbolism than I'm even catching yet, but um, the fact that he was, that all these thorns were taken off the acacia tree and put on his head, I think there's some really deep symbolism in that. And he took, he took all the thorns for us so that we could become polished in the similitude of a palace. And this word shittim can also mean this. This is a, a container of some sort. And it can it can mean wicker or it can mean clay. And the original in this in Hebrew, this is the word tet. And the word uh, the letter tet, its meaning is clay. The meaning of that particular letter. And so it could mean sharp clay as well. And uh, human beings have in the Bible are a lot of times compared to a clay vessel a clay container. And the word Adam means red dirt. Adam was made out of dirt, basically. He was made a vessel. And uh, we find this in Paul's writings in 2 Timothy. Now in a wealthy home, there are not only gold and silver vessels, but also ones made of wood and of clay. And some are for honorable use, but others for ignoble use. If someone cleanses himself of such behavior, which it was, it was just listing in the previous verses, he will be a vessel for honorable use, set apart, useful for the master, prepared for every good work. So we are, we are naturally sharp clay. And the, the, the potter, in the same way that the carpenter ha would have to take the wood and would have to smooth it and shape it and prepare it, in the same way the Bible talks about the potter, and uses the same symbolism with the potter, taking that clay and forming something out of it. And he, he keeps working with it and working with it and keep forming it. And uh, he wants to make it a vessel for honorable use. That's what Christ is the potter and we're the clay. He wants to make a vessel that he can use to put his Holy Spirit in. Kind of like the lamp, uh, the oil is the Holy Spirit and the light, we can become a lamp uh, that will shine light to the world. We're the light of the world. So it, all these all these symbolisms all come together. And uh, naturally, we are sharp clay or the sharp thorns of the shittim tree or whatever symbolism you want to use. And if we don't let ourselves be smoothed, we're gonna when we come together in church uh, fellowship, we're gonna be poking each other and harming each other. And this is what Paul warned the Galatians about. He says, however, if you continually bite and devour one another, beware that you are not consumed by one another. But I say, live by the spirit and you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. Uh, that word shittim, it's the two front teeth and some of the meanings for that, not just sharp, but also devouring. And that's the same thing Paul just used here. Don't make sure you're not consumed by each other. Because <laughs> we, we human beings, we naturally have very sharp front teeth. <laughs> And uh, we naturally will, will bite and devour each other. So this is the question for us. Will we stay as wild trees with thorns? Or will we allow ourselves to be trimmed and polished and united with our brethren and covered with polished gold as part of the palace for the king of the universe? That's our decision that we have to make on a daily basis. And every day when we wake up in the morning, we need to have very first things surrender our lives to God because all through the day we're going to be me in contact with other people and every decision we make all throughout the day every little decision we make is either gonna weigh into our eternal life or um taking us away from eternal life and taking us closer to eternal death and everything that we do it's either going to have some impact one way or the other whether it's what we eat at lunchtime if we eat something that has too much oil in it it's gonna make our blood sluggish and it's going to clog up our brains and we might not make good decisions. We might 
come in contact with somebody that really needs to hear the gospel and we might not even recognize it because our brains are clogged up and we're not thinking clearly. So somebody might be lost for eternity because we ate something with too much oil in it. Or if we don't drink enough water, uh, our blood is gonna be sluggish and it's not gonna supply our brain with as much oxygen as it needs. And we aren't gonna have a clear mind and we might fall into temptation. We might be a bad example to somebody and we might be lost, somebody else might be lost. It might have a bad effect on our families, whatever it might be. Everything we do, all these little things we do every day, it's all has some impact on eternity. And so the decisions we were making day by day determine what kind of board we're gonna come out being. And as you know, a carpenter, when he's working with wood, if the board just isn't workable and you just, you keep trying, trying, and it's just, this board is just not enough good left to use. You just gotta throw it away. And so we gotta make sure that we're, we're allowing the master carpenter to do the work he needs to do on us to make us part of his palace and so that we can be fashioned after the pattern. And here's another word. This is very interesting too. This is the word for board. And the first symbol here is like the picture of the sun setting on the horizon. It's the sun just going down and it has the idea of gathering, gathering the light as the sun is disappearing. It's gathering its light and going away. The Hebrews had a kind of different way of thinking. We don't think of the sun as gathering its light, but that's, that was the thoughts in their mind. And the second little symbol is a man's head. And then of course, the third one is the shin, the two front teeth. And pressing together is one of the meanings of that, like your teeth pressing together, eating something. And literally the meaning of this, when you put these letters together, it would mean gather them in and press them together. If you just take the, sim the, the meaning of each letter and that's the word for board. So that's, that's the perfect symbol is, or the perfect meaning for the symbol that we were just talking about, about gathering all the little pieces of wood together, pressing them together into a beam and then making it part of God's, God's palace. So the very word for board contains this idea of putting together the wood into a, basically we could think of this as our fellowship, our church uh, group, all of us being fashioned and prepared to be put together and then covered with the gold of Christ's righteousness. And it says, there's no time now to range ourselves on the side of the transgressors of God's law to see with their eyes, to hear with their ears, and to understand with their perverted senses. We must press together. That's that word that we just read. We must labor to become a unit, a, a solid beam, to be holy in life and pure in character. In other words, covered with gold. Let those who profess to be servants of the living God no longer bow down to the idols of men's opinion, no longer be slaves to any shameful lust, no longer bring a polluted offering to the Lord, a sin-stained soul. This is another quote. Let the believers heed the voice of the angel who has said to the church, press together. In unity is your strength. That's, those boards had to, those, those were heavy boards. They had to um, have a lot of strength in them to stand upright. Love as brethren, be pitiful, be courteous. God hath a church and Christ hath declared the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. The messengers the Lord sends bear the divine credentials. I have tender feelings towards you, but come to the light, I beseech you. Again and again, the angel has said to me, press together, press together, be of one mind and one judgment. Christ is the leader and you are brethren, follow him. So this is the meaning of the wall boards for us that uh, we need to press together in church capacity. We need to gather the men and press them together. Uh, it's that, that's um, those first two letters. It's the word for a holy convocation. That's what we're doing here today is having a holy convocation where we, we gather together and we press together so that we can become polished like the boards of the sanctuary and be covered with the gold of, of a pure Christian character and be prepared to be a dwelling place for the most high. This is a quote, I don't know if you can see it real well, but um, 
mom found this in her Bible as we were driving here this morning, and I thought it was really good, so I put it in here. The narrow upward road leading to home and rest furnished Jesus with an impressive figure of the Christian way. The path which, the path which I have set before you, he said, is narrow. The gate is difficult of entrance, for the golden rule excludes all pride and self-seeking. That the golden rule is like a measuring stick. When you're making something out of wood, you may use a measuring stick, right? We don't have them made out of gold, but the heavenly carpenter he has is made out of gold. And so he has to measure, make sure it's the right size and shape. Okay. Um, where was I? There. there is indeed a wider road, but its end is destruction. If you would climb the path of spiritual life, you must constantly ascend, for it is an upward way. You must go with the few, for the multitude will choose the downward path. In the road to death, the whole race may go. With all their worldliness, all their selfishness, all their pride, dishonesty, and moral debasement, there is room for every man's opinions and doctrines, space to follow his inclinations, to do whatever his self-love may indicate, may dictate. In order to go in the path that leads to destruction, there is no need of searching for the way, for the gate is wide and the way is broad, and the feet naturally tend into the path that ends in death. But the way to life is narrow and the entrance straight. If you cling to any besetting sin, you will find the way too narrow for you to enter. Your own ways, your own will, your evil habits and practices must be given up if you would keep the way of the Lord. He who would serve Christ cannot follow the world's opinions or meet the world's standard. Heaven's path is too narrow for rank and riches to ride in state, too narrow for the play of self-centered ambition, too steep and rugged for lovers of ease to climb, Toil, patience, self-sacrifice, reproach, poverty. The, contradictions, the contradiction of sinners against himself was the portion of Christ, and it must be our portion if we ever enter the paradise of God. This part here about that we can't cling to any besetting sin. Uh, I've been very impressed with that lately, that we're, we're living in, in the shaking and sifting time now, and I, I just see people falling off the path left and right. And I just think we got to let go of every sin, every defect, because Satan is going to, he's going to have falsehoods and he's going to have temptations just targeted just for whatever things that we have that we haven't gotten rid of. And so that's incredibly important right now that we have to, we have to let go of everything that's going to hinder us from traveling this path. So I pray that, that we can be polished after, after the similitude of a palace and during this coming week that whenever we whenever we find the carpenter sandpaper rubbing us or, or we're pressed against the grinding wheel, um, that we won't complain, that we'll let him do his work that he needs to do so that he can accomplish the wonderful purpose that he's working on to make us part of his temple.